her talk. Thanks so much, Sue. Um, it's so nice to be here, uh, even if virtually um, at the LSE, uh, where I did so much of the research for this book, um, to honour Eileen Power, whose life and work it's been such um, a pleasure to spend the last five years researching. Um, Power is one of the five women, as you say, whose, um, whose stories I tell in my book. Um, and the women are drawn together by the coincidence, I guess, that at some point in the years between the wars, they spent time living in Mecklenburg Square out on the eastern edge of Bloomsbury. I'm going to share my screen and share a PowerPoint. I began square haunting in 2013 when I discovered that two of my favourite writers, H.D. and Virginia Woolf, had lived in the same square during different world wars, writing about the horrors of air raids and the mundanity of waiting for an impending death, separated by 20 years but only a few yards. I was intrigued by this coincidence and the more I researched, the more fascinating people I discovered had made their homes there, and in particular there seemed to be an abundance of pioneering women writers. The more I researched, the more I realised that this was partly an accident of geography. Bloomsbury had been laid out by the Duke of Bedford over the early part of the 19th century, intended as an upper middle class suburb with grand houses and leisurely squares intended for wealthy families. But by the time these mansions were ready to be lived in, these families who could afford them had moved out to fashionable West London, and these enormous houses first languished empty and eventually were divided into flats. And this happened at a time of great social change in women's lives in particular. The campaign for the vote was gaining pace, new universities had begun to open up and women were entering the workforce in larger numbers than ever before. Women were no longer wanting to move directly into marital homes, but were seeking places where they might live alone or with a friend and find a practical living space that would suit the professional ambitions they were starting to nurture. And as I walked around Mecklenburg Square, I began to think about Virginia Woolf's essay, A Room of One's Own, in which she argues that a woman needs money and a room of her own if she is to write. That room is a very fertile metaphor for Woolf, and it became, in a way, the central metaphor or sort of guiding principle for this book, too. It signifies, first and foremost, a physical space, a place within a house where a woman can work, interrupted. But it also contains within it the idea of finding a place in society where her work will be taken seriously, where she'll be free to express herself as an individual, not constrained by expectations of femininity, not be excluded from education and from institutions, but will find a way of flourishing and fulfilling her potential, doing the work she is best suited to do. And this, I think, is what each of these women in my book was hoping for when she arrived in Mecklenburg Square. This is a painting of the square um, done by an artist called Ernstine Duplessis in the 1930s. Each of the women in my book came to Mecklenburg Square at a different stage. Some were at the very beginnings of their careers and others at the ends of their lives. Some were at the height of their fame and others came there before they'd worked out who they really were. But I realised that for each of them, however long they spent there, arriving in the square was a time of transition and of redefinition a chance for them to make a choice about the kind of life they wanted to lead, where they wanted to work, who they wanted to live with, and what and how they wanted to write. Their paths sometimes crossed through mutual friends, literary influence, or in one case, doomed relationships with the same man. But as I researched the book, I realized that what really brought these women together beyond this coincidence of address was their determination to find new forms of living, to write about women as they had not been written about before, to devote their own lives to work, and finding a way of living that would enable them to do that, despite the challenges they continually faced as women wanting to be heard in the public world still geared towards men. The American poet H.D. Hilda Doolittle arrived there during the First World War and spent decades untangling this turbulent year in a series of memoirs and novels written at the encouragement of her psychoanalyst, Sigmund Freud. She began a series of poems taking their voices from heroines of Greek mythology, allowing them to speak for themselves for the first time. Dorothy L. Sayers was one of the first women to graduate from Oxford, which opened its degrees to women in 1920. Um, Cambridge didn't until I think, 1948. Um, she arrived there determined to write, but unsure where to begin. And it was in Mecklenburg Square that she wrote her first detective novel, featuring the beloved detective Lord Peter Whimsey. 
Jane Harrison, the classicist, moved in in her 70s after a long career at Cambridge, where she had made her name with a series of, of historical works which challenged the popular perception of Greek religion and suggested that behind the well-known male gods lay a forgotten history of mother goddess worship. She arrived in Bloomsbury from Paris, where she had absconded from the university determined for a fresh start and spent her last two years living here with her partner, Hope Merlis, translating Russian literature. And Virginia Woolf moved in on the week that the Second World War was declared. And as bombs fell around her, she looked back over her own life, working on a childhood memoir, a biography of her old friend, Roger Fry, and her final novel. But tonight I want to focus on Eileen Power, who is shown here um, in one of her amazing dresses, um, lecturing at Girton College in Cambridge. She was the only one of, of my subjects to spend more than a few years in Mecklenburg Square. She was there from 1922 until her death in 1940. And it was from the square that she saw and helped to shape the dramatic political developments of the interwar years, both at home and internationally. Power arrived in the square with a truly international outlook derived from an unconventional and really quite brave period of travel in her 20s. She had studied medieval history at Girton College in Cambridge um, and then spent a year at the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, and then she received an Albert Kahn Fellowship, which gave applicants money and sent them around the world for the purposes of widening their minds and hoping that they would come back to educate their compatriots in what they'd seen. Um, Power visited India, where she met activists who were working to overhaul British colonial rule, including Gandhi himself, and China, which was in the grip of immense social change. And the trip not only gave her a deep and lasting appreciation of these cultures, which fed into all of her subsequent work, but made her aware of the human scale of the British Empire and of her own responsibilities as a historian and as a teacher to write history with a firm awareness of its bearing on contemporary politics. She wrote to her fellow medievalist George Gordon Coulton that the AK Fellowship has been my ruin, for my heart will stray outside its climb and period. I think I shall have to compromise by working at the trade between Europe and the East in, in the Middle Ages. While she was in Madras, she received a letter from the London School of Economics offering her a lectureship in economic history. She didn't hesitate to take up the position. She was frustrated at Cambridge's reluctance to follow Oxford in offering women full membership of the university, which she'd been campaigning for for years. And she was eager to live outside the increasingly narrow confines of a women's college. And she knew that working at the LSE would offer her a chance to be at the centre of London's left wing intelligentsia. Power had already spent two years at the school as a doctoral student between 1911 and 1913 on a fellowship established in 1904 by Charlotte Payne Townsend, the wife of George Bernard Shaw, um, which was given specifically to support research into women's lives with the aim of producing a new canon of women's history. When power arrived, the school was young and vibrant, if something of a building site. It had been founded by Fabian socialists with a mission to advance the socialist cause in Britain. It was co-educational from its foundation and dedicated to social reform with an emphasis on vocational training. Power was taught by Lillian Knowles, the first woman in Britain to work as a full-time teacher of economic history. And she worked there alongside a cohort of historians, including Vera Anstey, Alice Clark, and Ivy Finchbeck, who were all looking to the past for models and alternatives out of frustration at women's present political disenfranchisement. This immersion led to her study of medieval nunneries, which became her first published book, and later to her surprise bestseller, Medieval People, which was a pioneering work of social history, which drew its material from the daily lives of ordinary people. In this book, Power sets out to challenge the view of history of, as the public lives of great men, and argues instead, as she puts it, that the obscure lives and activities of the great mass of humanity were just as important to consider. History, she argued, is made not of one-off events, but of community activity and gradual change. She wrote, not only great individuals, but people as a whole, unnamed and undistinguished masses of people now sleeping in unknown graves have also been concerned in the story. It's an idea that I think it's, has you know, grown in popularity today, but in 1924, it was quite revolutionary. 
when power returned to the LSE in the autumn of 1921, she joined a fa faculty of radicals whose collaboration would inspire many of her future projects. The school had developed a pace under the directorship of William Beveridge and was now a leading modern university. And over this year, the LSE was the epicenter of what Beatrice Webb described as a circle of rebellious spirits and idealist intellectuals. Power's colleagues included the economists Lionel Robbins and Friedrich Hayek, the anthropologist Bronislaw uh, Malinowski, um, and Harold Lasky, whose outspoken lectures led one Conservative MP to denounce the LSE publicly as a hotbed of communist teaching. But its staff's intimate involvement in politics, both British and international, proved to be the LSE's greatest strength. On Monday afternoons, staff and students would convene for, for what were known as grand seminars, where issues of the day were discussed without hierarchy, and with a sense of urgent practical purpose. Power took this attitude into her own teaching, and the seminars that she led with her colleague and neighbour in Mecklenburg Square, R.H. Tawney, soon spilled into long evenings at Mecklenburg Square, where students would discuss ideas with their professors as equals. Many of these went on to become stalwarts of the Labour Party, including Evan Durbin, Hugh Dalton and Hugh Gateskill. And Power's regular kitchen dances at 20 Mecklenburg Square were attended by economists, politicians and novelists, including Virginia Woolf, who recalled sharing a packet of chocolate creams there with the civil servant Humbert Woolf. This is the invitation to one of her parties. It was in these surroundings that Power realised the full political import of her work. Tawney wrote that economic history was the study not of a series of past events, but of the life of society. And working with him and her other colleagues, she began to see parallels between the medieval period and the economics of Soviet Russia, the rising capitalism in Asia, and the increasing nationalism in Europe. Since her trip to China, Power had been eager to work on comparative history, seeking to understand the activities that had brought the world together over time, rather than the wars and conquests that had divided people. The main business of the historian whose work lies in a school of social studies, she wrote in a lecture delivered at the LSE in 1933, is to contribute his data and the assistance of his method to the general purpose of elucidating the present. And in tandem with the courses that she and Tawney ran within the university, exploring the rise of modern industry and the evolution of capitalism, Power began to look outside the academy, wondering how her work could hold meaning in a world which looked increasingly like it was approaching a second world war. The only way, she wrote, to cure the evils which have arisen out of purely nationalist history and to a lesser extent out of purely class solidarity is to promote a strong sense of, of the solidarity of mankind as such. And how can this be better begun than by the teaching of a common history, the heritage alike of all races and all classes? Over the 1930s, Power poured her energies into a series of broadcasts to children on the BBC, focusing on international history, designed to instill a sense of world citizenship in a future generation. Power had been involved in the work of the League of Nations since her days at Girton, and wrote that if the League of Nations is ever to become real, children must leave school with some idea of the community to which they belong, mankind. As well as the broadcasts, which she designed along with her sister Rhoda, who lived with her in Mecklenburg Square and who created dramatic interludes while power focused on the lessons. She worked on a world history textbook to be disseminated into schools and wrote numerous articles protesting against the teaching of purely nationalistic history, which would present other countries as enemies or allies. She urged instead a focus on the many activities which have connected nations, such as trade, travel, literature, agriculture, and religion. Her aim, which she reiterated in articles and speeches throughout her career, was to teach history so as to widen instead of to narrow sympathies, instilling in students an essential sense of community. Her work stands in dialogue with historians like Arnold Toynbee and H.G. Wells, whose comparative histories of the world, published around this time, Power greatly admired. In fact, here is a photo of her with H.G. Wells, which um, strangely was published in an advertisement for cigars. <laughs> I'm not sure why, but that's where I found it. This work 
I think demonstrates Eileen Power's commitment to a new sort of history. And she was developing these ideas at the same time as really establishing a new idea of how a woman scholar might be. She enjoyed surprising people who saw her fashionable clothes, you can see here, and her light-hearted demeanor as incompatible with their vision of a staid blue stocking. Her students remember her unwavering support for their work and her determination to improve the conditions of her employment, especially her pay, which she was painfully aware was always lower than her male contemporaries in order to create conditions for a new generation of women scholars to follow after her. This sense of anger at the injustice of women's subordination and determination to change it characterizes all the women in this book who were grappling with the question, as Dorothy Sayers put it in her amazing novel, Gordy Knight, of how women cursed with both hearts and brains might find emotional fulfillment without sacrificing their intellectual ambitions. Jane Harrison argued in 1914 that the virtues supposed to be womanly are in the main the virtues generated by inferior social position. And this theme resounds through a room of one's own where Wolf challenges women to find new ways to write about their own experiences and about women's history in order to create a tradition of subversive women's writing for future generations to build on. In the last year of her life, Wolf began work on a history of English literature told through the character of Anonymous, which she never finished, but which would have explored the ways women have been silenced and their work lost or never given a chance to flourish throughout history. And as she researched, she noted in her diary that she'd gone out to buy a packet of cigarettes and a copy of Medieval People. It seems like a lovely moment of solidarity between my subjects and an example of them reading each other's work and, and using it to fortify them. Power had died earlier that year of a sudden heart attack and her work hasn't survived as prominently as it should. So I hope that this book and the work being done by other scholars and archivists at the LSE and beyond can restore, restore her to the collective memory as her work has so much to teach us today. And there she is. Um, um, that's the talk, which is maybe a little shorter than expected, and I'm very happy to take as many questions as as people have. If anybody has got any questions, um, I I have have one which I was uh, thinking about earlier today. Well, perhaps while other people um, get their questions. Um, together, um, which is that um, Jane Harrison moves to Mecklenburg Square after a long kind of career at Cambridge and Eileen Power moves there much younger, um, almost deciding that a career in Cambridge isn't feasible, I suppose. Um, how, how important do you think is that, that kind of radical, that break? Because there's no doubt that I think Eileen Powell was actually very attached to Cambridge. Um, you know, I mean, in many ways, emotionally attached to it. And yet she makes this, this quite strong radical break with it. Mm -hmm. um, for both of them, you know, what did it mean make, you know, walking away from that? Mm. Well, I guess, yeah, the, the kind of contrast between Jane Harrison and Eileen Power is, is in some ways a sort of generational one. I mean, Jane Harrison, was born in 1850 so she's a generation older than Power and the other women in my book and she was one of the very first students at Cambridge um, where the women's colleges were were new and experimental and um, and as she I think found you know an immensely important and supportive community at Newnham um, but after she left college she found it very difficult to be accepted in any other university and she um, applied over and over again for lectureships and was constantly rejected um, and ended up really forging a, a career for herself kind of outside the, the academy. She, she took walking tours um, around museums, she lectured in schools and in working men's clubs um, and she traveled across Europe and the Middle East visiting archaeological digs, um, working on cutting edge material um, while you know her contemporaries were, were in their studies um, and it wasn't until she came back um, to Cambridge though when she was finally offered a job at Newnham that she really had the time and space to just settle down and work on on the books that um, that would kind of revolutionize um, ideas around 
Greek religion. Um, but I think in her 70s, Jane Harrison, like Eileen Power, was getting frustrated at the kind of intransigence of the um, of the university. It's its sense that these women's colleges, which were very you know, supportive in themselves, weren't properly considered part of the university and the continual refusal to offer women degrees, I think, for both of them. Um, just made it made it impossible for them to um, sort of see themselves continuing to work there. And so, for Jane Harrison, her her response was to leave academia totally and go to Paris and um, you know and sort of start afresh. You know, at the age of, of seventy five to um, to turn her attention to Russian and to live among a community of of emigres working on literary magazines and um, and doing very different things. Um, but power took a different approach, um, which was to come to London and to kind of forge a path for herself in a very different environment um, and to work alongside her colleagues and her friends and her neighbours um, in a sort of egalitarian situation of, of, the, of the LSE. I think um, you know, it was a different response to, to this and she worked both from the outside and from the inside, I guess, to um, to forge a career for herself as a kind of public intellectual, which took a great deal of self-confidence. And um, she often, you know, she really enjoyed surprising people and um, and defying people's expectations, um, but did of course find it wearing as well. Yeah, I just find it interesting because I think Alice was in many ways founded by the web to be absolutely radically different from places like um, Oxford, Cambridge, or even the, the kind of northern red brick universities with places where there was part time evening teaching, people could still work and, and study at the same time. Yeah. Um, all those things it made it quite, you know, it was it was a, a conscious decision. I think even the fact that it's a school rather than a college is almost, a, you know, a conscious decision to be, to be different. You know? Yeah, and so many of the faculty, you know, were standing for parliament or were, you know, were closely involved with, with politicians and with the Labour Party. And you know, I think, you know, she, her sort of network really expanded far beyond academia. Um, and it was a real chance to mm. be, you know, in a, in a fully sort of modern and influential environment. And I think that's what, you know, what made her history work look outwards so much as well, because it really did feel like it had a bearing on, on the wider world. So we've got a nice list of uh, questions for you now. So um, I'm going to ask um, if, if people would like to, if you can, uh, when I introduce you, if you could unmute yourself, if you want to um, uh, deliver your own question, otherwise I will do it for you. So, so Nikki, you're, you're there with a, a question, if you'd like to ask it. She... Many. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of read it out then. So, um, did you find other interesting subjects who lived in Mecklenburg Square and how did you actually um, choose who to, to uh, kind of select? I know from having read the book you did, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, spoiler. Um, yes, there were, there were other women who I decided to leave out um, who would have been brilliant to include and I guess I left them out partly when it seemed like there wasn't enough um, archival material to give a kind of full chapter to each of them when you've got to be sort of competing with someone like Virginia Woolf who's left so much material. Um, there was a, um, and I guess also I wanted to keep the focus on on writers. Um, there was an amazing um, lawyer called Helena Normanton who was one of the very first women to practice at the bar who um, who lived in Mecklenburg Square and on the she'd um, qualified but women weren't allowed to to take up position and and on the day that in 1919 when the sex disqualification removal act was passed she apparently walked from Mecklenburg Square down to um, to the inns of court to kind of petition for um, for herself to be you know, finally given her due. Um, but she, um, in fact, I think her papers are in the Women's Library at the LSE, but it seems that she destroyed all of her personal papers. So it would have been difficult, I think, to have to have given a sort of portrait of her 
inner life as well as um, her achievements, which was a problem I faced with Eileen Power, of course, as well. Um, in the archive, there's a huge amount of, um, of sort of personal material from her early years at Girton, um, but much less um, after she came to the LSE, the papers become much more um, professional and it's really a record of, of her devotion to her students um, and to her work, um, but much less of her personality, although I got such a sense from the early material of, of her sort of sense of humour and, and indignation at, um, at injustice. Um, there are, yeah, there are lots of other people and they kept sort of <laughs> coming across them. There were some amazing artists and, um, and suffragettes. Um, the Kenny sisters, I think, lived in Mecklenburg Square just before my sort of cut-off time, which was the, the First World War, because um, I wanted the book to cover the interwar period. But yeah, the more you sort of research a place, the more fascinating stories you, you uncover. There are two um, slightly related questions that I'm going to kind of bring together here. Alina Congreve has asked, um, says that you know, Eileen Power does actually have a proper Wikipedia entry, unlike a lot of other women, but how well is she reflected in, in web entries and textbooks and other sources? And perhaps slightly related to that, um, Felicity Jones is asking, um, why do you think she's not been better known or been a, a subject of more extensive study? Although there is a biography of her by Maxine Burke. So. Yeah, Maxine Berg's biography, I think it was published about 2000, um, was the first sort of full, full study um, of power, which um, I guess is part of a sort of a, a move of historians and um, economic historians to, um, to really look back on this interwar period, particularly around LSE as a, a really exciting moment of, of activity, particularly among among women historians working in the same place and you know doing work that that shouldn't be forgotten. Um, I think power a lot of a lot of power's work I guess survives in quite intangible forms. I mean she dedicated so much energy to her teaching and to these um, to her broadcasts and to and to articles in the popular press where which you know which do risk getting lost or else their impressions are kind of intangible you know effects on on people's lives rather than on um you know in something that can be cited more easily um and a lot of her friends and colleagues were um you know were standing for for election and um and publishing you know big books but she she did a lot of collaborations which i suppose is the kind of work that that often gets forgotten about um and her you know, her insistence on sort of looking outside of the academy and looking to to children and as you know as the next generation whose whose attitudes needed to be changed in order to ensure peace for the future um it was i guess a sort of selfless <laughs> act in a way because it wasn't built at you know at shoring up her own name um and ensuring lasting fame um and after she died she instructed her her sisters Rhoda and Beryl to um, destroy her personal papers, um, which is why not so much of that survives. So, um, so the portraits of her that have been written have to um, have to fill in certain gaps, and um, you know, and which is one reason why it did work to sort of include her in this form, where the where sort of putting placing her lives alongside others could help to fill in. Um, some of those gaps where the sort of resonances and the um, and the work that she was doing on on women's history could could come out with a by being read alongside Virginia Woolf, who you know who read and admired her work and um, and um, whose room of one's own um, really speaks to so many of the same concerns as Power, who wasn't ever working in isolation. I know that um, in his address at her funeral, Tawny said that she was her own greatest work mm. rather than her academic, that it was actually her whole life, which was, you know, kind of demonstrated who she was. She wasn't somebody who sat down and mm. lecturing and everything, that she kind of um, became who she, who she was. Um, Claire Taylor's um, asking about the connections with disseminating history to children through the medium of radio. 
and the musical interludes and and it's asking was it part of a series and connections with other initiatives aimed at that audience such as peter and marjorie cornell mm. it was it was an ongoing long-running series um, she was one of the first um in the BBC's um, Schools Broadcast series, which um, I think was started by Hilda Matheson, who was the director of talks at the BBC, who was a close friend of, of Eileen Powers um, and who, who got her on um, for several kind of series of, of these talks, um, which, which she and Rhoda did together. And it is a, some wonderful pictures um, in the BBC archives of, of um of people recording these these programs with with actors um sort of doing the sound effects um and um and they were they were yeah pioneering um projects i mean it was a the, the technology was was brand new and the the behind them was to produce these talks that could be broadcast across across the country directly into schools and would be supplemented by sort of brochures and reading lists um to the teachers um, and so I think they they kind of relished the sort of democratic um, aspect of it and the and the chance to speak directly to people when um, Hilda Matheson and wanted was desperate for HG Wells to broadcast on the BBC and um, and Eileen Power sort of arranged it by inviting them both over to um, to lunch at Mecklenburg Square so that um, Hilda Matheson could sort of charm HG Wells who'd refused to broadcast and she wrote him a very persuasive letter afterwards saying how how kind of exciting it is to to be able to kind of have a free hand and know that your words are going um, they're going straight into people's living rooms um, and there's some amazing correspondence in the BBC archives between her and the sort of editors at the BBC um, who um, who wanted her to um, to include more um, images of, of of soldiers in her um, textbooks and to to talk more about war. And she wrote that very firmly to say that's completely against my principles, and you know I won't I won't do it. And they also wrote a book, didn't they, together, Boys and Girls of History, which was kind of a, a, another kind of side um, connected to all this. So I think it's a, another example of how both places like LSE and the BBC at this time are really new, so they can kind of do different things. They're not um, tied down by, you know, a tradition or a, this is the way you, you should do things and, you know, kind of... Rhoda had quite an extensive career at the BBC working in children's broadcasting. Yeah. Um, and uh, Balaka has asked them um, about her personal life, uh, her family, um, partners, whatever. So, so a, a bit more confident, I suppose. It, it, it is a fascinating story. <laughs> yeah, it all is. Um, Again, well, I guess the there were some amazing letters um, in in Girton when she's sort of just leaving university, kind of railing against her her friends who um, you know, had all been students together, but were then going straight off and getting married and you know, having children immediately. And she thought they were wasting their potential. And she wrote to her friend um, Marjorie Spring Rice that the cause that I care about most of all is the cause of women and, and something like the ideal wife is modeled on the algebraic negative and you know and you and I have to make sure that we never you know fall into these traps. Um, he was briefly engaged um, to a man called Reginald Johnston who um, who she met while she was in China. He was the um, tutor to the to the last emperor of China there's an amazing um, film about it which which he sort of has a star and role in um, and it's a bit unclear what sort of happened or why their relationship didn't work out um, my sort of speculation is really that um, that she at this point her career was was developing and she was being invited to to go and teach in America and to to travel the world, and I think there was a certain kind of ambivalence, perhaps on on both sides, about the prospect of of settling down. Um, but she did get married um, when she was, I think, forty seven to um, Michael Poston, who was one of her um, research assistants at uh, the LSE. Um, and I guess a, a kind of theme across the whole book is, is um, 
re relates to relationships and the sort of relationships all of these women were were looking to form or to avoid. Um, Dorothy Sayers in um, in her time in Mecklenburg Square um, had a relationship with a kind of very condescending older writer who um, who really didn't think much of her writing and um, and really sort of ground down her confidence. And in her novel Gordy Knight. Um, she creates this character, Harriet Bain, who's clearly modeled on her, um, who she sort of maneuvers so that she can, without losing um, dignity, get married to the detective, Lord Peter Whimsey. And it's an amazing, the whole book is an amazing kind of interrogation of, of, of the way that a relationship can be established on the basis of, of equality. Um, and when Power announced her engagement to Michael Foston to their colleague J.H. Clapham, apparently he, he and his family raised a toast to Harriet Bain and Lord Peter Whimsey, um, which was sort of shorthand for, for this as a, a kind of perfect match. Um, and it seems um, from the small bits of correspondence um, that I've been able to see that, um, that this relationship was um, one where their sort of shared work really took precedence. They'd worked together and written together for, for decades. Um, and it was clear that, um, you know, that, that that was the basis of their, um, of their partnership. Um, and the sort of tragedy is that Power died only a few years later, um, very suddenly of a, of a heart attack and, um, and the relationship didn't have the <laughs> longevity that, um, that it would have otherwise had. I think um, I've always found her kind of her own family background actually fascinating that mm. um, she and her three sisters, her two sisters were all, I think um, her father actually was a, a, a bit of a, <laughs> he, he was in prison for fraud, uh, yeah. leaving the family effectively kind of orphaned with, um, with her mother and they went to live with grandparents. But interestingly, for the period, I think all three girls were brought up with the idea that they had to earn their own living. And they went to live in Oxford so that they could go to Oxford High School and have a good education. Um, Eileen and, and Beryl both went to Girton, I think, and then uh, Rhoda, yeah. uh, Beryl then became a, a leading civil servant and uh, Rhoda, of course, entered, went to the BBC. And I always say to people, the thing that I always find amazing is these three women, they all have Oxford DMB entries, which is, is quite amazing for the period that they have all achieved something that kind of merited that kind of recognition in, in quite different fields. But they were all quite clearly brought up with the idea that they were going to have to fend for themselves in some way. And they all did, you know, so uh, that is also quite an interesting background. Um, Caroline's asking if any of Eileen Powell's work is currently in print. I think Medieval Women is still available and um, I do know that Medieval People and her book on nunneries is actually on Project Gutenberg if you wish to just download it or read it online. So um, her work is still... Post Sorry? Uh, Poston um, edited Medieval Women um, after her death, which was a collection of, of pieces about the, the lives of, of individual medieval women, which um, which she sort of had worked on around the same time um, as Medieval People, and that was published, I think, only you know, relatively recently. Um, 74, I think, originally. Yeah, so. um, and it's still in print. I, yeah, Medieval People is quite easy to sort of get hold of that I don't think is actually in print. It was one of the first Pelican books. Um, so it was sort of mass produced in, in paperback um, and very widely read um, at the time. Uh, the copy in our house is actually, um, was a school prize relatives actually in the 1950s. So it was obviously um, given to school children then as something, something to read. Yeah. Um, Una Gay is, is asking whether LSE was ever challenged about the lack of equal pay for women lecturers like Power. Um, they were certainly challenged by the women lecturers. <laughs> um, I, I don't, speaking as the LSE archivist, um, certainly Lillian Knowles, who was Eileen Power's predecessor, um, was very um, 
vocal and feisty about um, her, her desire to be paid the same as her contemporaries. And certainly there are um, letters in Eileen Powers' personal file where she writes to the director saying, don't you think it's time I'm paid such and such rather than what I'm being paid now? Um, I suspect externally, no. Um, I don't think there, there was um, that much pressure, but certainly internally there was. And indeed, um, when Eileen Powell was seeking to be paid the salary of a reader as opposed to a, a lecturer, Lillian Knowles just turned around and said, I thought she was already getting it and why not, you know, sort of. So um, they were very different characters in terms of politics, but they were both absolutely together on the need for, you know, kind of for women to be equally recognised for the work they did. So I don't know whether you found anything else, Francesca. Mm, no, just that, that it was possible to trace in the archive her own um, sort of gradual incremental rise in salary and her, um, you know, her robust uh, letters back when she was offered you know, no raise or small raise um, and pointing out exactly how much work she, she was doing, often more work than her than her colleagues and how, you know, how she was covering all sorts of courses and editing the economic history review and, you know, running the seminars and lectures and uh, during the war taking on Boston students as well as her own when he was sent off on diplomatic missions. Um, yeah, she was aware of it. So both Lillian Knowles and Eileen Power were very well known for the fact that they put a lot of emphasis on teaching mm. and not just doing research, which is kind of a perennial question in academia. But I mean, I think Lillian Knowles was one of the first people to actually have office hours for students. Mm. Um, and, and Eileen Power also kind of prioritised that that side of her work. Yeah, um, the difference between her and Jane Harrison actually when, because Jane Harrison had spent sort of 40 years um, without a kind of a, a permanent, you know, paid job. And so when she arrived at Newnham, she insisted that she wasn't going to spend <laughs> this time on teaching. She wanted it to be, you know, research and writing time only. And um, and I think they were sort of slightly surprised, but sort of agreed. And I think her colleagues were, <laughs> were pretty annoyed <laughs> that she got away with it. Um, but yeah, I think for power, you know, the kind of collaboration and community was, you know, was, was personal as well as political. And it seems that she you know, the energy she put into her students was enormous. Debbie, uh, do you want to ask your question about Paul Robeson? Hello, yes, sorry, I won't put my video on, but just to say, um, I was really interested in um, the Soho Club, um, and Paul, was it the Soho Club? That um, Paul Robeson was barred from, and just her attitudes to sort of race and segregation at the period anyway, given she was writing on international history, Hmm. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, I wish I knew more about her connection with Paul Robeson. I tried hard to, to sort of look into it, but I, there's just an anecdote of, um, of her going to her club. I can't remember which, the Gargoyle Club, I think it was in Soho, um, with Paul Robeson, uh, the, you know, the Black American actor um, who was refused entry and she resigned her membership um on the spot is the is the story and i think i did look into it and i think his wife aslanda robeson had a connection to the lse and possibly taught there it's, it would be in my notes somewhere i can't quite remember i was interested especially because paul robeson um in the 30s acted in a film alongside hd um called borderline where um hd played a sort of very very neurotic um character um, and her partner Briar who I think sort of financed the film um, has an amazing cameo in it um, yeah I don't know Sue, have you did you come across Aslanda Robeson anywhere? Uh, Robeson actually studied at LSE she hmm. um, uh, studied anthropology under Malinowski and was um, there at the same time as people like Homo Kenyatta hmm. and it's kind of part of her development into pan-Africanism and um, was the opposition to um, the civil rights movement in the United States. There is actually, a, uh, on the LSE history blog, there is actually an article about Eslanda Robeson on there. Um, it's possible that, of course, 
power new robes as lander robes and you know in the lse estate as it were um but yeah, yeah as lander she wasn't actually studying for a degree but she was kind of um with a lot of the kind of postdoctoral students going to Malinowski's anthropology seminars and things. So um, it was very much kind of around the school uh, in the 1930s. Yeah, well, the attitude would have been totally consistent with her politics. I mean, she was she was always alert to, you know, to race and class as, as well as to gender and her, um, you know, her, I mean, China was her real sort of passion and um, her, her insistence that you know the, his, the history of the world should be taught you know, not as the gradual move from you know power from east to west but as you know a, um, a, a collaboration and she was very um when um when japan um invaded china in the 30s she was she really campaigned for um for people in um in europe to take that um that sort of aggression seriously and um you know not not just um you know, to see it as something happening far away that didn't have any bearing on them, but, you know, but to see it as an important, you know, violation in its own sake. Um, Alice Autumn, um, do you want to ask your question? Uh, can you unclick? I realise now that one person couldn't, so. Hi, sorry, um, my internet's a bit slow. Um, yeah, I just, it's okay. I was quite interested in what you said about her beautiful dresses and her clothes. Um, I just wonder if there was any sort of more detail on that. Um, like, did, where did she get them? Like, she encountered a lot of pushback on kind of being an intellectual paying an interest in fashion. Hmm. Yeah, she um, apparently she flew to Paris whenever she had an article published and um, and bought a new dress there. Although I wasn't able to find a complete source for that. Um, she had she, when she was in China. She bought a lot of um, of kind of embroidered gowns, which she wore sort of quite flamboyantly um, around London. In fact, she even lent them to a theatre at one point for a um, for a performance. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think her you know her love of fashion was you know was was a was an ongoing personal interest. And she um, even when she was at Girton, she wrote that she thought that the the students and the fellow dons weren't taking her seriously because um you know they were all and she was rather disparaging about how sort of unfashionable the other uh, the other Girton women were and um I think increasingly it was a kind of a, a performance to you know as a display of of um you know that kind of traditional femininity needn't be incompatible with with the intellect um and she, you know, she was very aware that um, that often, you know, she'd turn up at a dinner in her honour, and, and people would assume she was, you know, someone's wife. And I think she sort of relished the chance to um, to kind of prove them wrong. And she had total confidence in her ability to, um, you know, to have to sort of change their minds. And I think, you know, she saw that as part of her her project, I guess, to um, to change perceptions of what uh, a woman intellectual might look like um. but she does she talks about when she's studying at the Sorbonne as a kind of uh, graduate you know graduate student she does talk about going out and buying two wonderful hats and dresses <laughs> and that she hasn't got the money for it but you know what the heck really <laughs> yeah she spent all of her stipend on <laughs> clothes I think. and all her stipend on what she wants really mm. I think that's um her independence really um I've always liked the fact that the beginning of her will, it's all about giving away her earrings and her mm -hmm. Chinese um, gowns and coats, which she um, gives to close friends and um, various bits of jewellery um, uh, she gives to her close friends and to her sisters and, and particular embroidered gowns and things. So it's almost like they're the most important things they have to be, you know, they have to go to the right people, people yeah. cherish them. Um, I don't know, I, I've not seen much that's overtly opposing how she dressed or whatever within the kind of LSE context, but I do know that kind of the school secretary under Beveridge, Jessie Mayer, was really not very fond of, of Eileen Power. I think they really were rather chalk and cheese. And uh, uh, I'm sure I can imagine Jessie Mayer, who was perhaps at times a slightly dour Scot, to, to uh, be a bit too um, stereotyping. 
um, would have found Eileen Powell's flamboyance rather difficult to to take, and I think um, uh, that that may have been a bit of a bit of crit criticism there, but but not explicit, I don't think, at the time. I think if anything, it was probably just a wonderful flash of colour in a, a set of buildings that were not always that bright and cheerful, probably. Um, I'm hoping I'm not missing out too many questions. There was one, um, There's one about um, Alina again has asked us whether there, there are any moves within the history profession to rebalance the role um, of women historians. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Francesca? Mm, I'm not sure. I mean, I think um, I think that there's definitely sort of moves within within biography and I guess in writing to, you know, to sort of recover voices that have been left out and you know, to reconceive of history very much along the lines that, that Power was suggesting. Um, and, you know, looking, looking back through archives to, you know, to sort of uncover stories of people like the, you know, the ordinary medieval people whose lives um, she voiced so vividly and often, you know, creating, you know, very sort of novelistic portraits out of out of the detail that that exists and you know filling it in with you know with kind of expertly informed speculation um, and it creates a very sort of modern texture I think um, and you know really sort of shook up you know the idea of what what history or biography would be which Wolf of course writes a lot about um, as well, how you know biography needs no longer to be, you know, just sort of straightforward, you know, narrative linear tellings of you know public public deeds um, done by great men, but it mean, needs to perhaps be impressionistic or to you know to focus on a kind of inner inner life and not um, just be sort of you know be praiseworthy. <laughs> Um, she wrote a lot also about the the history of London and um, the way the sort of history it tells through its statues. And um, I sort of start my book with the this anonymous woman who's um, kind of outside um, the entrance to Mecklenburg Square, um, who sort of symbolises for Wolf all of the kind of lost lost histories that have um, that haven't been told. Um, and I think Power was you know was very alert to that need. And um, and now of course you know there's plenty of moves for, for London to sort of tell different stories through its, its statues. And I think, yeah, the same is definitely happening in, in history. And I mean, I hope within the universities as well. Lisa Butler, would you like to ask your question? Um, sure. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm dialing in from my kitchen while cooking, um, as one does on Zoom events these days. Um, so my question um, was about um, history. <laughs> um, so um, power, as you acknowledge in the book, um, was one of a group of um, uh, quite professionally respected at, at the time, um, very serious um, and professionally prominent women historians who were active in London and, and throughout the UK. Um, but it seems to me that their legacy has subsequently been largely forgotten. Um, I wonder if you think that maybe their historical legacy and their, their contributions to social history and women's history um, were obscured by later radical social historians of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, and, and I'm thinking specifically of you know, groups like the Communist Party Historians Group or the New Left. There's sort of this wave of social history that, that tends to define social history for historians um, retrospectively. And it always seems to me like that amazing group of women historians like Eileen Power, um, and, and, and others sort of get written out of the kind of story of, of, of women's history and of social history in, in Britain. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, um, if there, I mean, there has been some resurrection of these people in the last decade or so amongst historians, um, but I'm wondering if you think that, um, like that they've been unnecessarily obscured and if there could be more work to do in that respect. Mm -hmm. 
yeah I think I think they could be um yeah I suppose it's you know it's interesting how cycle how history sort of goes in cycles and I mean a lot of the women of the of this period of the sort of 1920s were, were kind of rediscovered in the 1970s I guess of out of a sort of impulse to you know to um to often kind of led by publishers sort of you know Virago and um, the women's press and places like that to um to bring back you know writers like like HD and you know and even Virginia Woolf who who after in the 50s and after she died was um her sort of political work was really sidelined in favor of a sort of portrait of her as this as this sort of um eccentric um and you know I think we we do sort of create history you know in in the image of our of our present and um and I guess that's why you know these histories need to be continually retold and and reassessed um and I mean someone like Eileen Power's work speaks so clearly to to today um I mean researching her over the last few years you know thinking about Brexit for example and reading her you know her warnings against the dangers of you know thinking in isolation and um you know and writing nationalist rather than internationalist history um you know makes makes it feel like a sort of timely reassessment um and you know future generations will will come to her and others with different perspectives too i think just one uh, just just one final question as we're hitting 7 30 now um oliver basquiano is asking having spent so long with the subjects of your book did you find yourself liking some of your subjects more than others? <laughs> I did. And I, I think I, that changed over the course. Did you start <laughs> off thinking, oh, I'm going to really enjoy writing about, I don't know, HD, but actually finding it was someone else who was... Uh... Yeah, I think so. I think... Um... I mean, and honestly, I think Eileen Power, you know, was my was my favorite really, just because she was so unexpected in lots of ways. She was definitely the one I knew least about um, before I started researching, and you know, and just found her voice and her and her politics so appealing. And um, and I yeah, I only wish that there could have been more of a of her sort of personality um, in it because I think she would have <laughs> been a lot of fun. To spend time with for sure. I found an amazing um, correspondence between her and Dorothy Sayers, who just met each other once um, at a party, and um, and Eileen Power ended up sending her a book, um, which um, she, which she recommended. And I think those two, if they'd got to know each other better, would have got on very well. There's a, they definitely both had had the best senses of humour of of these five. I think. Um, but I guess I came to like them all in different ways. And you know, they're not, well, some of them are sort of role models in some ways and, and very much not in others. Um, but I think, you know, in reading them together and in, in looking at the ways they all sort of dealt with, with the same kind of problems and questions, which, you know, are just ones that we are still working out today, um, was, you know, a very sort of validating and fascinating process, I think. Well, thank you, uh, Francesca, for a really fascinating um, talk and one that has prompted so many interesting questions as well. I think it's been a really interesting evening. Um, as people who know me know, I can usually talk about Eileen Power for quite a long time because I just find her such an interesting, um, both her and Lillian Knowles, both really interesting subjects. Um, thanks to everybody for your questions. Um, it was so so good debbie do you have anything you want to say before we finish um, no not really i've put about our next event which is on the 21st of october um which is actually um about borderline which is the film that francesca mentioned which has hg in it and if anybody wants to watch it beforehand we're going to have a discussion about that and about islander robeson's politics um so yeah but otherwise just thank you um so please do put any comments in the chat um, but, but thanks very much to Francesca and I can, there's lots of people saying I really look forward to reading the book and I can honestly say get the physical copy because it looks gorgeous as well doesn't it so it's a really nice yes, it does. <laughs> get a physical copy which I've sadly left in my office I realised that I was doing this but anyway um, yeah it's a great read and um, full of really and, and just interesting to to find out about so many of these these women and their places that link between people and place is so strong. <laughs>
Oh, thank you. And it's so nice to be here, even if not in the actual LSE. <laughs> and thank you for again for your support in writing it and researching it, because I did lots of it at the at the Women's Library. And there was lots of getting out the boxes of Eileen Powers and RH Tawney's files and finding gems within. So thank you again. Okay. Well, thanks to everybody and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. I'm going to end the event now, everybody, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you.